Archiving started. Welcome to um, presentation on Chapter 10, which is going to discuss how to conduct interviews and how to conduct larger investigations. Let's get started. <clears throat> Um, it's a very common thing for paralegals to uh, be uh, the ones who interview clients, especially after the initial interview. We'll talk about, or we have in, in previous lectures talked about the fact that many times the first interview that a client has with a law firm, the attorney will be involved, especially if it's not a screening or intake type interview where the attorney is confident that if the client decides to hire the law firm that the attorney will be interested in the case, it's an opportunity for the attorney to persuade the client to sign on with the law firm, to develop a relationship. So many times under those circumstances, the attorney will be present during the meeting. Again, um, only the attorney and the client can establish an attorney-client relationship ultimately. So uh, after that first meeting, though, many times the paralegal will have a prominent role in gathering information and communicating with the client. This does, however, vary to a fair degree based upon the nature of the client and the nature of the client's particular legal issue. If the law firm is dealing with a corporation and is dealing with in-house counsel with attorneys or paralegals who work for the law firm, it's likely that the attorney will that the attorney for the law firm will will control those interactions and the paralegal will have little if any direct contact with the in-house counsel. That's because um the idea is, I guess, that attorneys like to talk to attorneys and that that is seen as a good client relations move. However, when the law firm is representing an individual, who in most cases obviously isn't going to be a legal professional, many times the paralegal will be the primary contact. And this can be useful in several different ways. One is that the paralegal may not be as intimidating to the client as an attorney um, might be perceived by the client. So the client may be more comfortable, may be more willing to share information. The client may also be happier because typically the hourly rate for the paralegal will be significantly lower than the attorney. <clears throat> Let me pause here and talk a little bit about billing rates. Uh, for, for years in my position as um, a paralegal instructor, I was telling uh, paralegal students that paralegals usually earn between $75 and $125 an hour for their law firms. Obviously, they don't earn that much, but that's the type of income that they're generating for their law firms. And so I would use $100 as a ballpark figure. I've since learned that um, my numbers were dated, that probably a more likely number for a paralegal to charge is more like, char or that the law firm charges the paralegal at, it's probably more like $150, probably the billable rate will be between, say, $100 and $200 an hour. But obviously, whether it's $75 to $125 or $100 to $200 an hour, the attorney will be billed at significantly higher rate, probably something along the lines of double uh, the rate that the paralegal is billed. So imagine if you are an individual who's going through a divorce or wanting a will drafted or having a contract dispute or something like that, would you prefer to spend an hour with somebody who is billing at $150 an hour, or would you prefer to spend an hour with somebody who's billing at $300 an hour? Most of us would say, I'd rather uh, only spend $150 for it instead of $300, unless I'm getting a lot more bang for my buck with that $300 um, expense. And in most cases, there isn't going to be a significantly greater um, utility with the attorney conducting the interview versus the paralegal. So... <clears throat> The paralegals will oftentimes interview clients in order to establish that rapport that may be easier to establish with the paralegal during the interview, and also it can be significant cost savings to the client. And this is especially appealing when you're talking about individuals who are seeking legal advice or small business owners who oftentimes are very uh, cost sensitive. So for that reason, paralegals oftentimes are the primary contact with clients. But again, every law firm is going to be different. Um, if you are the attorney for Deion Sanders when he's going through a divorce, um, he may well deal exclusively with the attorney because he has the financial um, assets to uh, to bear that type of expense. So every situation is different, and every attorney approaches these issues differently. And, of course, paralegals have different strengths. Some are great at interviews, some not so much. So 
Um, I'm saying it's a frequent thing for paralegals to be involved with, but it's not inevitable. And um, so there's a, definitely a spectrum here. Um, in addition to interviewing clients, paralegals also will be responsible for conducting a lot of investigations. And sometimes this will happen in a litigation situation where you're either deciding whether your client has a valid claim that uh, merits going into litigation or perhaps developing the facts to support your client's case that is already in litigation. And this obviously will involve interviewing the client, of course, that will probably be the most important part of the pretrial investigation, but it will also involve interviewing other witnesses, uh, people who are associated in some respect with the client, but people who might even be hostile to your client's interests if they're willing to be interviewed. So uh, the, the, the scope of interviewing can be beyond the client. And there are some different issues that arise when you are interviewing somebody other than the client, and we'll talk about those a little bit in this um, chapter. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about how to conduct an effective interview, and in more large sense, an effective investigation. Now, um, like many things, you know, if I were to have a lecture and, and the lecture was about how to ride a bicycle, um, I could tell you all the theory of what is the smartest way to learn to ride a bicycle, but we all know that the way you learn to ride a bicycle is riding a bicycle. Um, yes, knowing something about the um, aerodynamics of a bicycle, the physics of it, how the various brakes and, and wheels work, and all that stuff is useful, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to spend some time on the bike to figure out how to make it work. And that's similar to interviewing. Um, it's all theory until you actually get into a situation where you're responsible for conducting the interview. And uh, so that's something to keep in mind. It's good to know the theory, but you also have to have opportunities to put it into effect. So let's go to the next slide, planning the interview. Like most things in life, if you plan for it, you're going to find that you're more likely to have success. Um, uh, and so it's an important part of the process to plan for. Sometimes it feels like, well, um, that's just causing the whole process to take more time and costing my client more money. In fact, many times planning an interview can actually save your client money because you can be more streamlined um, in how you approach the issue. So if you spend, for example, 15 or 20 minutes planning the interview, you might be able to limit the actual time that the interview is going to take to an hour. But if you went in unprepared, it might end up that that hour-long interview becomes a two-hour long interview. And so you actually end up charging the client more money. So that is definitely something to consider. Obviously, you can over plan for anything, but it is helpful to have a plan. What are the topics I need to cover? What is the order that makes most sense? Are there certain topics I ought to reserve for a different interview? Um, things like that um, that are helpful to think through and um, anticipate and plan for. It's also a good idea, especially if you're interviewing the client, to talk with the attorney about um, what might be an effective way of interviewing this particular client or this particular witness. He or she might have some insights uh, based upon personal knowledge about this person or perhaps based upon the facts of the case. There might be some points of sensitivity or concern that the attorney can uh, let you be aware of that will make the interview more successful, maybe will preserve a relationship that might have been in jeopardy if, if uh, things had been said in a less graceful way. It's good to have a checklist or some type of outline. Many paralegals will start with a standard checklist that they have that they use in most of their cases, and this is a good starting point. Let's imagine that you work for a law firm that is primarily involved in car accident cases. Well, guess what? While there's lots of differences between car accident cases, there's also a lot of similarities. You're going to want to know the location. Where did the accident happen? You're going to want to know what car your client was driving and what car the other guy was driving. You're going to want to know if the police were called. You're going to want to know if a ticket was issued. And if a ticket was issued, who received it and what was the um, uh, uh, claim that the police officer was making. You're going to want to see, did, did anybody go to the emergency room? You're going to want to get those records. Was surgery necessary? Was there physical therapy necessary afterwards? Um, all of those issues are going to be some standard things that come up, um, and that's just a partial list. 
And yes, you know, if it's a fender bender, it might you might not need to go into as much detail versus uh, an auto fatality. But many of the same issues are going to be the same, whether it's a very serious incident or a less serious incident. So it's helpful to have a checklist to make sure you don't miss anything. But it's also important to customize your checklist because each case has a little bit of a different wrinkle to it. And it's easy to uh, miss the forest for the trees. I'll give you an example from my practice. Um, I had a colleague, an HR manager, I'll call her Sally for um, for the purpose of the story. Sally was inter was scheduled to interview a um, a man. We'll call him Bob. Let me just write this up here and keep my character straight. So Sally is the HR professional, and she's going to interview Bob. The reason that she's interviewing Bob is that Bob has been having some problems with his manager. We'll call the manager Sue. Sally doesn't really know what the problems are, but um, Sally has some information that Bob doesn't know, which is that Sue has been um, in some disciplinary trouble for a while. She's made several poor decisions in terms of managing her staff, and Sally is thinking that Bob may have some additional examples of Sue using poor judgment. And in fact, Sally is thinking, you know, if, if Bob tells me something that is really significant that I can confirm, it might be such that Sue is going to lose her job. Now, obviously, Sally isn't sharing this with Bob. Bob, as far as he knows, this is the first complaint that's been lodged against Sue. And so Sally goes into the meeting with a little bit different agenda than Bob did. And of course, she, she's not sharing it with Bob. So they sit down and um, she has a list of questions that she's prepared for the meeting with Bob, the standard questions that she asks in quest, you know, case after case. Um, where she handles the uh, employee complaints. And one of the issues is, um, has Sue ever acted inappropriately towards Bob? Um, usually when she asks this question, um, the employee will share things like uh, the use of profanity, the use of sexual comments, um, uh, someone being a jerk, to a, sub a supervisor being a jerk toward a subordinate, things along those lines. Um, and so that's kind of what Sally is thinking Bob might share. She doesn't know, but that's what she's thinking Bob might share. And um, Bob thinks about the question, and he says, well, yes, Sue has acted inappropriately towards me. Um, there was that time that I was on the phone um, with, a, with a customer, and Sue put a pocket knife to my throat. And so Sally hears this, and she duly writes down, Sue put pocket knife to Bob's throat. And then she goes on to her next question, um, you know, something about, uh, tell me about your last performance appraisal and what was that. Sally doesn't ask any follow-up questions about the knife at the throat. I mean, there's some obvious ones that you and I, in the more calm uh, context, might think, well, where did this pocket knife come from? Was it Bob's pocket knife? Was it Sue's pocket knife? What was it doing out to begin with if it was Bob's? Um, why did Sue put it to Bob's throat? Was it in anger? Was it a joke? Um, you know, what did Bob do when Sue did this event? Was anyone else present or heard anything? Maybe in the next cubicle heard what was happening. How long ago did this happen? Um, you know, there's lots of questions that present themselves from that context. Sally didn't ask a one of them because it wasn't on her checklist to ask about, well, anything about a pocket knife, because after all, the vast majority of situations, an employee is not going to say, well, my supervisor held a knife to my throat. And so there aren't any standard questions. So when you prepare your checklist, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to look it over um, and, and inspect it to see if it covers the particular situations that you're already aware about in your case. You'll want to add some questions or perhaps remove some questions. But perhaps more importantly, when you're in the interview, you need to have a list of, of questions, things along the lines. I'm going to erase this for a second. Things like why, how, witnesses, where, when. Context, what happened before and after? What's the underlying relationship? How did the person respond? So a response to the situation. 
and there's other questions too, but these are some examples. And usually they're the the W words that uh, cause the um, interviewee to um, expand upon uh, the topics that are being discussed and present some additional information that helps the interviewer have a more robust understanding about what's going on in this particular situation. Um, so it's good to have, in addition to your checklist, this other checklist that when you get those questions and you, your jaw drops and you don't know what to say and you are very, very surprised, well, if you have these questions, you can say, why did it happen? And, of course, Bob might say, well, I don't know. Or he might say, well, the, the day before, um, Sue and I had been kidding about something, and I pulled out my pocket knife and held it to her throat, and we all laughed about how funny that was. And so she did it to me the next day. Well, that's a different situation, hardly appropriate, of course, but it's a different situation than if he says, well, Sue um, has been threatening my life for years, and I thought she was about to slit my throat. She had, you know, blood in her eye and was saying, I'm about to kill you. Those are two very different experiences, and so um, you're going to get a more robust understanding about what's happening if you give the interviewee an opportunity to expand upon what he or she is saying. If you don't know what a good follow-up question would be, if you forget to ask why, how, when, where, why, all of those questions, another good approach is just to say, can you tell me more about that? Or if you're really struggling for something to do, don't say anything at all. A helpful strategy for an interviewer to, to take on is um, when you want the interviewee to provide more information, don't say anything. Most interviewees will become kind of uncomfortable if there's an awkward silence, and they will start filling it in with more information. And that can be an effective way of, of getting new information. Now, I'll let you know it's sometimes not, not effective insofar as it makes the interviewee uncomfortable and make the, may make the interviewee uh, not be as well disposed to you because of that level of discomfort. But it is one approach, especially if you are trying to see how it, how uh, confident the interviewee is um, with what he or she is saying. If you are um, perhaps uncertain whether the interviewee is being honest with you and you want to kind of test that, or you want to see how the interviewee is likely to handle um, a stressful situation, obviously, when the other side interviews this interviewee at a deposition or um, at trial, um, you, you, they may well apply pressure tactics, so it's helpful to know how your client or your wit witness here is going to respond to those kind of stress, stressful situations. So it's good to have a checklist, but it's also good to be open to expanding that checklist. Um, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about the issue of recording interviews. Before we do this, I'm going to clear the slide and talk about um, one party versus all party consent. I like to call it all party consent instead of two party, but I'll let you know right now that most people will call all party consent two party consent. Because our assumption is when you're having a conversation is there's two parties to the conversation. But let's go through some examples. Imagine for a second, um, and by the way, Texas is a one-party consent. And for the sake of argument, let's say Colorado is a two-party consent state or an all-party consent state. Okay, so we are in Texas, and we have person A is talking with person B. They're the only two people present. Person A has a microphone or a tape recording device in his pocket or her pocket. B does not know it's there. B can't see it. A is recording the conversation. A knows that A is recording the conversation. Um, he has made a conscious decision to do so. Um, in Texas, that would be lawful because one of the parties, A, knows about the tape recording. Uh, B doesn't know about it. But B would not be able to successfully sue A for um, uh, a violation of the law because A knew that it was being taped. Let's look at another example. Here, I'm going to erase. Oops, there we go. Um, so we'll again have A, 
and B. Then let's say A and B are buddies and A is has his tape recorder again and A has shown it to B. Hey B, you know, I got this new tape recorder. I'm going to, you know, kind of fiddle around with it. It's okay if I tape you? And B says, oh, sure, fine, whatever. And so B knows that it's being taped. Well, that's an all-party consent situation. Uh, that would be lawful in Texas where you only need one party's consent, but it would also be lawful in Colorado. When everybody present knows they're being taped, it is definitely lawful to tape. Um, but let's say in the middle of this conversation, C walks up. Well, A doesn't tell C that he's taping the conversation, and B doesn't tell C that the conversation is being taped, and it's not obvious. You know, B, A has the tape recorder in his pocket or whatever. So C participates in the conversation, says some things, listens to some other things being said, and doesn't know it's being taped. Well, in Texas, again, that's perfectly lawful because you only need one party to know about it. It would be adequate in Texas if A were the only one who knew about the tape recording. Um, in Colorado, B doesn't have a basis of a lawsuit because he consented, he knew, but C would. And that's why I don't like to use the term two-party consent because in this case, you do have two parties that have consented. But you have C, the, the new party, the third party, and C hasn't consented. And under those circumstances, it would be a violation of Colorado law for A to tape record C because C doesn't know that A is being taped, that A is using the tape recorder. Let's look at another situation. A, again, has the tape recorder. He is talking with B um, and also C. Or in Texas, A doesn't share with B or C that he is tape recording the conversation. He actually doesn't have it on his physical person. He, uh, let's say there's a table that they're all sitting around. He actually has hidden it underneath the table. But it's sufficiently subtly hidden that B and C can't see it. Well, again, in Texas, this is perfectly lawful. Um, in a one-party consent state, B and C don't have any recourse if A hides the um, uh, tape recorder, um, as long as A knows he's taping it, it's okay. In a two, all party or a two party consent state, B and C would have uh, the basis for an action against A. But let's say that um, after a while, A steps out of the room. He leaves the conversation. He doesn't, however, remove his tape recorder. So he's out of the picture. He's over here. B and C continue to talk, and the tape recorder continues to pick up their conversation. Maybe an hour passes and B and C leave that room and A goes back in, retrieves his tape recorder, and listens to the conversation that B and C had. Well, this is unlawful everywhere because neither B nor C consented to the tape recording of their conversation. So it would be unlawful in Colorado because they didn't know they were being taped. But it would be also unlawful in Texas and in other one-party consent states because A was no longer present and so the fact that he consented to the activity doesn't um, make it acceptable. So under those circumstances, you really have no party consent. But as I said before, the rule in Texas is um, a generous rule for the tape, record, tape recorder um, that it's a one-party consent state. Having said that, um, there are ethical problems with attorneys secretly tape recording conversations. Um, and because a paralegal works for an attorney, those ethical issues would also apply to the paralegal. So even though it's not unlawful, generally speaking in Texas, to secretly tape record conversations, it has significant ethical problems for attorneys to do that. So if you in your private life want to secretly tape record your friends when y'all are out um, you know, painting the town red, um, you're not in legal trouble, and the friends probably not going to like it too much, but um, when you're act acting in the role of a paralegal, um, then that is something that you should not do. And you always ought to talk with the attorney with whom you are working to see if it makes sense to record a particular interview. Let's assume, for the sake of the argument, that the attorney says, yes, I think this makes sense to us to tape record, tape record this interview. Well, let's talk about some strategies that you might want to do. For one thing, you're going to want to make the tape recorder very obvious. You're going to want to, when you start the tape recorder, say something like, I'm starting the tape recording. I have Bob Smith with me. Today is uh, January 17th, 2014. Um, 
and I am we are in uh, conference room B in our office complex. Um, and you are very likely to want uh, Bob to acknowledge that. Uh, Bob, can you speak into the microphone so that everyone can hear your voice? And so Bob would say something like, hi, I'm Bob, or whatever. You may even want Bob to acknowledge that he knows the conversation is being taped and that he consents to the taping of the conversation. And that way, there can't be any question about anything secret or underhanded happening. If you need to change tapes, you're going to want to uh, start your next tape by saying, this is a continuation of my interview with Bob. This is tape number two. Um, this is the time that this is beginning. It was 2 o'clock when we started the first tape. It is now you know, 3.17 where we're starting the second tape, et cetera, et cetera. And again, get Bob's acknowledgement. If there's a break for some point, someone needs to go to the bathroom or uh, some other uh, issue comes up, um, and so you pause the tape for any period of time, you'll want to, again, when you come back, say, I'm turning the tape recorder on, Bob is still with me, da 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 If there are other people present, you'll want to also get their uh, voices and names on the tape recorder. Perhaps you have a, um, a secretary present to get various documents um, or perhaps to take notes. And so you, under those circumstances, might want to have, uh, and we have secretary um, uh, Jane Green here, Jane, would you be able to speak into the record and, and get that resolved? So those are some strategies to work with recording. Now, I said before that you'll want to talk to the supervising attorney before you decide to record because there are several reasons why it can be a poor idea to record an interview. So this is a good idea, but I would say um, there are definitely situations where the attorney is likely to say, oh, I don't think this is the case for that. For one thing, um, people, when they're being interviewed, especially in a law office, are inherently nervous. Usually a pretty big deal in their life is at issue, and they're in an office that is a little bit alien to them, and they're talking with people that have skills and knowledge and vocabulary that isn't something that they are exposed to on a regular basis. So they may feel a little intimidated, a little inferior, a little defensive under those circumstances. Um, when you add to that the idea of being tape recorded, it adds a whole other level of anxiety for folks. People respond to that anxiety in lots of different ways. One response is to become very chatty. Um, but an, another response that you'll see fairly commonly is the person will shut down. You know, you get kind of name, rank, and serial number out of them. They aren't expanding upon their answers. They may have been very forthcoming before you hit the record button, but now you're getting monos monosyllabic answers without a lot of um, additional information. So you're having to really, really work hard to pry information out of, out of the witness. Now you may think, well, you know, is that really a big issue? And it's not always a big issue, but I can tell you from my personal experience. I was once in a um, small fender bender car accident, and um, I called up my auto insurance company and spoke to an underwriter there, and we had a lovely conversation for five or ten minutes um, about this and that, and it was kind of chatty. We kind of, I don't say bonded, but we, we were getting along quite well, kind of um, having some, some nice chatty time, and then she says, well, you know what, I think we're ready now for me to get your official statement, and I knew this was coming the whole time, and so she goes, is it okay if I tape record it? That's our procedure. I go, oh, yeah, it's fine. And so she started out very much the way that I just described. She talked into a recorder. She said who she was talking with. She said the date and the case number and all that kind of stuff. She got me to speak on the record, acknowledging that I knew it was being taped. And then she started asking me the same question she had already asked me. And I felt so different. Here I am, an attorney. I've been practicing for uh, 15 or more years at that point in my life. And I just felt like, ooh, I, I don't know what to say. I, I, this, this is official. This is on the record. And I could feel myself becoming less and less forthcoming. And so when she would ask a question before the tape recording, I might have given a five-minute answer or at least a several-minute answer. Um, now I was giving a three- or four-word answer. And I wasn't, uh, there wasn't anything that I had done that I was embarrassed about. I'd already told her all this information before. So it wasn't logical. It wasn't reasonable that I was having this response. And, of course, I was... Uh, a sophisticated interviewee under those circumstances, so it was less likely that I would be affected in this way. But I was significantly affected. And it was after that experience, frankly, that I thought to myself, ah, I, I didn't 
I do not typically record interviews prior to that time. But at that moment, I decided, oh, this is not, I'm not going to inter uh, record interviews going forward unless there's a very, very strong reason to do so because I can see how it shuts down the interviewee. So that's one reason you may not want to record the interview. Another reason is, so you have this recording of the interview. Let's say the interview lasted 60 minutes. Well, what are you going to do with that tape recording? Are you going to transcribe it? I once did that. I once um, what represented my client in front of the um, um, unemployment board in a particular state, and I had a hearing examiner. And the way they handled this state was that they would actually have the hearings via telephone conference, and they you could request a copy of the um, uh, little uh, cassette to be mailed to you for a very small expense. And but but they wouldn't be transcribed. You would have to transcribe it yourself. Well, at this point in my career, well, my secretary was pretty busy with other stuff, and so I decided, well, I'll just transcribe it myself. I'm a good typist, and so I sat down to do it. And I thought, well, you know, I can probably type about as fast as the people could speak. No, I couldn't. Um, I probably type at that point in time maybe 50-ish words a minute, and that one or two hour. Um, conference or conference call hearing took me at least four or five hours to transcribe. So you can see how you're really biting off a very significant time commitment to record it. Um, on the other hand, if let's say this had been just an interview, I could have taken notes during the interview. I'd probably want to supplement afterwards, but um, let's say the the interview lasted an hour. If I transcribe the notes, it'll take me three more hours. That's four hours of time to be spending on the um, interview. If I took contemporaneous notes, maybe the interview would take a little bit longer because after all, I'd have to pause the flow of the, the interview to take some notes. So maybe it'd take an hour and a half, and maybe I'd want to take 30 minutes after the interview to summarize my notes. But still, the total amount of time is two hours versus four hours. Most interviews probably don't merit spending that level of time um, transcribing it. There might be some that do, but your run-of-the-mill interview, probably not. So that's another reason um, that you might not want to tape record the uh, meeting. But the biggest concern, I think, for most attorneys isn't going to be the first two concerns. It's going to be um, the possibility of the tape recording becoming evidence in the case. Um, we're not going this isn't an, an evidentiary course. We're not going to go through the ins and outs of it. But it is more likely that a court would order a tape recording to be shared with the other side than a paralegal or attorney's personal notes from a meeting. Um, it's it's possible under extreme circumstances an attorney might order the personal notes to be given to the other side. Um, and but it's much more likely that an interview would be uh, required to be shared. So that could be a concern. And after all. It could be that the interview is terrible for your, your side of the case, and um, so you're giving really, really good stuff to the other side if you have to give up that interview. So for that reason, many times attorneys are reticent to record the interview, especially when they don't know what the witness is going to say. So those are some things to think about um, as you consider uh, the interview interviewing process. And as I say before, not only think about but involve the attorney in it. Um, there are some advantages, though. For one thing, um, when you take notes during an interview, it does interrupt the flow of the interview. Unless you're a tremendously fast note taker, there's going to be some dead time where you're writing down what the witness has said. Um, and that can be kind of awkward and artificial, and it can cause the witness to be a little um, standoffish or a little bit you know, kind of very aware that, in fact, this is not just a conversation. This is something official going on. Another thing that happens uh, with the tape recorder is you get the exact response. You not only get the exact response, you get the intonation. Um, and other people can listen to it, and they can have an opinion. Well, I don't think that was a truthful answer because of the way he said it. But if it's just your notes, well, you might have had the impression he wasn't being truthful, but an independent person looking at your notes really isn't necessarily going to be in a position to evaluate whether the person was being truthful or not. They really have to rely upon your analysis. But if you have the tape recording, 
Others can listen to it now. Obviously, it's not as robust as having a video recording where you can actually see the facial expressions. That would be a, another level of, of, um, of interview, which, of course, raises the same types of issues you have when you are a tape recording an interview. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the soft skills that are involved in being an effective interviewer. Um, one strategy that is very useful is to put the interview, interviewee at ease. You might want to engage in a little bit of small talk at the beginning. Now, time is money, and especially if this is your client, he or she is likely to be aware of the fact that you're going to be billing him at you know, $150 an hour or whatever, and so he doesn't want 30 minutes of small talk because he doesn't want to pay 75 minutes, $75 for the, the pleasure of engaging in small talk with you. But five minutes can make people relax, can make people feel more com com uh, comfortable. So, you know, good examples of small talk would be the weather. How was the, you know, what the office is like, you know. Oh, well, you know, would you, with beverages, would you like something to, to drink or something along those lines? Um, recent... Um, uh, non-controversial news stories. Um, oh, there was, you know, an avalanche in, in uh, you know, Switzerland or something. Isn't that terrible? Or something along those lines. Um, you're going to want to avoid topics that are controversial about religion or sex or um, politics. Um, but, there, but you may want to identify just a few topics that kind of everybody's going to resonate with. It's going to put everyone at ease. Uh, a common one would also be to talk about local sports teams. Although you always want to be prepared for the person who isn't into sports or happens to have come from a different town and has different uh, preferences. And you want to be, even if you're a diehard cowboy fan, uh, you don't want to antagonize the person you're about to interview by saying, oh, you know, you're the team you like is not so good. So it's a good idea to spend a few minutes on small talk, but you also want to transition pretty quickly to the substance. You're a busy person. They're a busy person. They're going to respect the fact that you are valuing their time moving relatively quickly to small talk, from small talk to bigger talk. You'll want to use clear language. Um, and one way to, to do this is keep, keep the words that you're using relatively small. Um, this is especially useful when you're dealing with witnesses who um, may not have a college degree or who may not speak English as their first language. Um, if you're using words that they aren't familiar with, um, that can be a source of embarrassment for them, confusion, um, hostility, or defensiveness on their part. And so using small words that is in, in someone's grasp of vocabulary can put them at ease and help you get better answers from them. It's also good along the same lines to avoid legal terms. You may routinely use a particular term in your practice because it makes the conversation easier when you're talking to other paralegals and attorneys and uh, 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 legal secretaries in the office, but when you're talking to the client, especially the client is not a legal professional, probably best not to use terms like interrogatories, unless and until you really explain what that term means, so that they're not sitting there thinking, what's that word? I'm too embarrassed to ask, but I don't know what it means, and I'm not going to be able to answer the question they're asking, because it doesn't make sense to me what they're saying. <coughs> Another thing that's important when you're doing an interview is remain objective. Sometimes you will feel uh, moved by what your client is saying. Um, you'll feel a lot of compassion for their circumstances. You may be able to relate to it because of situations in your life. So you may uh, kind of want to uh, bond with them on that level. Uh, well, a little bit of that is probably okay. You definitely want to pull it in a little bit. You want to pull it in for a couple of reasons. For one thing, kind of for your own mental health. Um, imagine that you are um, in a family law practice. Well, you're going to hear sad story after sad story. I mean, when people are getting, you know, most family law practice is about divorces. And uh, even if you're meeting with the person who wants a divorce, a divorce is rarely a happy thing for somebody to go through. And so there's going to be, that person's going to be unhappy, is going to be sad, and might be desperately sad. And if you start taking on those emotions or empathizing too much with their circumstances, you're setting yourself up for a career of down time. Um, so you, you need to develop some level of boundary between their circumstance 
and in your in your life and what you're kind of dealing with. So you need to get the facts. You need to understand what's going on. And many times the facts will be sad, but you also kind of need to say that's their life. I'm helping them. It doesn't help them for me to take that sadness on as well. But in, ad- in addition to the concerns about kind of your own functioning and not getting too glum about a particular situation, is you're actually going to get better advice if you have some emotional distance. Let's imagine that you're representing the husband and the husband's wife has left him for another man and the husband is very, very sad about this. Um, and the husband is concerned about preserving assets and about the child a custody situation. And um, if you get too in tune to his suffering, you may start thinking, well, surely a judge who hears this sad story is going to award the husband most of the community property, and surely the judge is going to award custody to this husband. And so you might not give the, um, the divorcing spouse a realistic perspective on his or her chances of prevailing because your judgment is being clouded by your own emotional reaction to the situation. And um, when you give a a bad impression or an inaccurate impression or you don't ask the hard questions because they're awkward to ask and you don't want to embarrass this person, um, that doesn't really benefit the client. For example, let's say when you're talking to this person who's very sad about the divorce, you don't really want to ask, well, what would you do to run run your wife off? Uh, That seems like you're twisting a knife into the into this person, but it's possible that they have some things in their background that are going to come out in the case, and better you know now so you're prepared. Let's say the husband was also unfaithful, or let's say the husband uh, uh, continuously watched pornography or um, uh, was very much absent from the home for extended periods of time, and so the wife had to kind of run the household and take care of the kids, or maybe the husband... um, was violent or made threats or had a substance abuse problem. So anyway, you need to figure that out. Even though they're tough questions to ask, if you if you retain remain somewhat of an emotional distance, it becomes easier to ask those questions, and it also becomes easier for the client to answer those questions. If you become friends with the client, it's sometimes harder to tell your buddy, yeah, uh, my spouse and I got into an argument one night, and yeah, I sure did kind of punch him or punch her or whatever. Um, That's hard to say to a friend because you care what this person thinks about you. But if you've retained that emotional distance, uh, telling your your paralegal, somebody who, after all, in this case, is over, you're never going to see again, say, yeah, I did push. Yeah, and and, yeah, there was a little bit of bruising afterwards. I've got to be honest uh, because you're going to hear it from my soon to be ex spouse, so yeah, that's what happened. So you can help the flow of information if you retain some objectivity or as much objectivity as you can. You also want to remain objective when the information you're getting is you're having a negative reaction to. Let's say instead of you representing the spouse that is being left, the um, client that you have is a spouse who's ditching her current husband for the um, the the new guy the the guy that you know the husband who she's been married to for 20 years who she has three beautiful children with who's in middle management well she's met Mr. Gazillionaire um, and she wants to marry him to lead the high life um, you may your reaction to this person may be oh I hold you in absolute contempt and you're just a terrible person to do this to your husband and to do this to your children um, but again that's not helpful. Even bad people, even people you disagree with, are entitled to representation. If she's paying for it, she is entitled to have somebody giving her solid advice and helping her through that process as much as possible. And if you're not able to be that person, then you need to let the law firm know about that. And you ought to think very carefully before you do that because the law firm is likely to say, well, what do I need you around here if you can't help us in the cases that we get? Um, So, um, and if, if... It's unrealistic for a law firm to only accept cases from people that they like um, because that's just not the real world. There's going to be unpleasant people that you are going to represent that are entitled to your best advice, even though you may be thinking on some level, gee, I think your soon-to-be ex-spouse was a nicer person in this marriage. Let's talk about the categories of questions 
that you might ask. And there's really four categories. There's open-ended, closed-ended, leading, and hypothetical. We have a little table here that goes over this. It's a little hard to see. This is from your textbook, though, so you don't need to spend a lot of time um, seeing the, this particular example here. Um, you're going to find that you spend most of your time on open-ended questions. These are questions that are relatively short questions but that cause the interviewee to give a paragraph or even an essay answer. Um, so these are questions that have those W words. Why? How? Uh, what was the context? Uh, tell me more about that. Can you expand upon it? Those types of questions. Um, uh, they're exploratory and they elicit a lengthy response. And here are some examples. Describe the morning of the accident. What did you do that morning? Again, a good approach here is to ask the question and then just pause. Let the person fill in the information. If you haven't gotten all you need, um, you may just kind of let sit there and let the person kind of let that awkward silence motivate that um, interviewee to provide more information. Or you can say, uh, what, more, what more can you tell me about that particular issue? This is going to be your bread and butter. This is going to be your main category. But it's not the only type of question you're going to ask. Closed ended questions are very helpful. Imagine that you are interviewing somebody, and it just so happens that in the accident, the person you're interviewing uh, who was driving was had had two beers uh, the hour before the accident. So there was some level of impairment. But he's not going to volunteer that. He, asked, You asked, describe the morning of the accident, he doesn't mention the two beers. He doesn't lie. He doesn't say, I didn't drink two beers. He just doesn't happen to share that. He talks about, well, you know, I went to Chili's. I had lunch. I got behind the wheel, and I drove to um, this place. And while I was driving to this place, I was in this car accident. Um, so he doesn't not he doesn't affirmatively tell you, I drank water or iced tea. Um, but he doesn't volunteer, oh, and at Chili's I had two beers. Um, so the way that you have to approach that is, that you have to ask the closed-ended question. Had you had anything alcoholic to drink that day? And that gives him a yes or no choice. He can say, yes, I did, which is truthful. Or he could say, no, I didn't, which in this case would be untruthful. Um, people do lie. People lie all the time. People lie to their attorneys and paralegals. So I don't want to make it sound like that doesn't happen at all. But you need to put that witness in the position where you get a definite answer. And sometimes it's necessary to put that pressure on them to get that closed-ended answer um, that will tie up the loose end. Um, this is also oftentimes useful with adverse or reluctant witnesses. Or if it's a witness who's not reluctant but is reluctant to share a particular piece of information. Another category which is less useful for you um, than the first two is a leading question. This is a question that suggests a particular answer. It usually sounds like a statement, and then you'll say, isn't it true, or isn't that right, or something like that. Um, you were running late for work that morning, correct? It's a question that implies, hey, I know what the answer is. I know you were running late, and I want you to agree with me. Usually a leading question um, has a statement that the witness would prefer not to admit to. Let's go back to the example of, uh, the person who had had two beers at Chili's. Um, you might say that instead of saying, did you have something to, to drink, if you had reason to think, yeah, he probably did. For example, let's say you had seen his receipt from the restaurant and it shows uh, that there was a bar tab and it was higher than what you would expect from a, a Coke or a, um, uh, an iced tea or something like that. So you're pretty much sure, you, know, you maybe don't know what he was drinking or how many drinks he had, but you know he had something alcoholic. Um, you might ask the closed-ended question, did you drink anything alcoholic? Or you might instead, because maybe you're concerned he'll lie if you actually give him the opportunity. And once he's told the lie, he may be uh, reluctant to uh, admit to telling the lie. He's kind of boxed himself into that position. So you might instead want to use a leading question. You might even want to show him the document. Um, Bob, you know, here's the receipt from the restaurant. I can see that there's um, uh, $9 that's on the, the bar tab, which... You know, since you're eating by yourself, tells me that he had something alcoholic. Um, and that's right, right? He had something alcoholic at Chili's right before you were in the accident. Isn't that correct? 
And at this point, Bob, who might have been tempted to lie if you had asked him, did you have anything alcoholic to drink? He knows he can't lie now. He's looking at the receipt. He knows you know. He knows if he denies it that you aren't going to believe him because nobody would believe somebody under those circumstances. So it is motivating the person to be truthful. Now, let's pause and talk about how these questions would occur in a courtroom. In a courtroom, it is routinely the case that attorneys can ask open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. Um, let me first of all pause and talk about um, what happens at trial from when, when witnesses are under, on the witness stand. Um, only an attorney can elicit testimony from a witness. Uh, so the attorney um, is that counts as an appearance before the court. The, the, the attorney actually has to be admitted to practice before that particular court. And um, so he is asking questions of the witness. If the witness is friendly for his, his side, and when I use the term friendly, I don't mean that the witness is a charming person that everyone enjoys hanging around with. Uh, friendly doesn't mean nice to be around. It means that you are on the side of the attorney's client. You have a loyalty or a bias in that favor. So, for example, um, if it's a car accident case and Bob was... Um, the one driving the car, he's being sued by Larry, the guy he ran into. Well, Bob's wife, who he's, Bob and his, his wife Mary have or have a happy marriage. Um, when Mary's on the witness stand, Mary is a friendly witness for Bob's side. But she would be a hostile witness for Larry's side. Now, again, it doesn't mean that Mary, when I say that she's hostile, that she's an unpleasant person or that she's going to yell or swear or do anything unpleasant toward Larry. But her loyalties, her... Um, assumption is I'm on Bob's side, this is my husband, and also more, perhaps more importantly is if uh, there's a big judgment uh, made against Bob, well, guess what? Bob and I have community property, and it's going to come out of my piggy bank as well. So when an attorney is handling that friendly witness, in this case Bob's wife, Mary, he can ask open-ended questions. He can even ask closed-ended questions, although he's going to spend most of his time on open-ended questions. But he can't ask the witness leading questions. This is prohibited of a friendly witness. And the reason for this is that there should be no need to kind of pull out this testimony from a friendly witness. For one thing, uh, an attorney had the opportunity to talk however long he wanted to with a friendly witness before the trial. So he could sit down with Mary and go, Mary, I'm going to ask you about... Let's say Mary was present at the Chili's Rest. I'm going to ask, going to have to ask you about the fact that Bob had two beers. And so I'm going to need you to be truthful about that. In fact, I'd like for you to volunteer it. When I ask the question, tell me about what happened before the accident, I want you to be the one that, be a stand-up person and say, yeah, when we were at Chili's, Bob had a couple of beers. I had a margarita and um, I also had the fajitas and Bob had a, um, a hammer or whatever the particular things is make it sound like I have nothing to hide, make it sound like this was just an ordinary event that um, you're not too worried about. That would be kind of the, the best strategy for um, the attorney to have it be volunteered through the open-ended question. But let's say Mary's nervous. She forgets to volunteer that. So then the attorney might um, need to ask a question um, when Mary fails to mention the alcohol. Say, well, well, Mary, did Bob have anything alcoholic to drink? Um, at the Chili's. And then she has the opportunity to say, well, yes, he did. He had two beers. So a closing question is fine. But what the attorney can't say to Mary is, isn't it true, Mary, that Bob had two beers at Chili's? Because, again, that's a leading question. Those can only be asked of hostile witnesses. Now, Bob's attorney can't ask Mary the friendly witness leading question. But Larry's attorney can and likely will ask Mary during cross-examination leading questions. It may actually ask Mary only leading questions so to, to drive home a point. She, he might say things like, isn't it true, Mary, that Bob had a beer at Chili's? Yes, it is. Isn't it true, in fact, that Bob had a second beer at Chili's? Well, yes. Isn't it true that he drained each one of those tall beer steins um, at Chili's? Well, yeah, I guess he did. And isn't it true that he immediately went to his car afterwards and started driving? Yes. All those are true statements. 
then those types of questions can be asked of those hostile witnesses. So these can be asked of any witness, friendly or hostile, but leading questions can only be asked of hostile witnesses, usually during cross-examination. There's a fourth category of questions that is even more restricted than leading questions, and those are hypothetical questions. Typically, these questions can only be asked of expert witnesses. So let's go back to Mary. And uh, Mary was present when Bob was drinking the beers. But it's Mary's opinion that Bob wasn't impaired at all well, after he had those drinks. Uh, Bob routinely has a couple of beers. He's a large guy. He's a very uh, good driver. In Mary's opinion, he wasn't affected the least little bit by having had the two beers. She felt very safe. After all, she would have gotten in the car if she didn't. Um, so um, Bob's attorney might be tempted to ask Mary something like this. Um, uh, in your opinion, do you think Bob would be impaired after having one beer? Well, that's a hypothetical question because Bob actually had two beers. And so um, Larry's attorney would object and say, um, objection, hypothetical question, calls for speculation. This Mary is not an expert witness, for example, not a, a doctor who is trained to evaluate levels of, of intoxication. And so those hypothetical questions can't be asked of non-experts. But it can be asked of, of, an, of an expert um, witness, um, whether the expert witness is hostile or friendly. And here's some examples of hypothetical questions. If a full-size van is going 60 miles per hour, how far before an intersection must the driver apply the brakes in order to stop the vehicle? That's just a matter of physics. Um, we all might have an opinion about how far that is, but um, you and I would just be estimating based upon our driving experience. We would not be qualified to answer that question. Only an expert witness would be able to under those circumstances. Okay, so you may be thinking, why do I, as a paralegal, have to worry about the differences between an open-ended question, a closed-ended question, a leading question, and a hypothetical question? Because after all, I, I cannot ask elicit testimony at trial or during a deposition. So I don't really need to know the differences between these. Well, actually you do. Um, not It's slightly less important for you to know than the attorney, but it's still very much important that you know the distinction between the two of these, between these categories. And that is that you are preparing the witness for his or her testimony. And so you're going to want to use a variety of questions. You're going to want to do, uh, present him with some leading questions. You'll want to preface it, most likely, with something along these lines. You know, when the other attorney um, is asking you questions, he's not going to be quite so friendly. He's going to be asking you the tough questions. And so let's practice what that's going to feel like so you know what the likely questions are going to be so you can get kind of prepared emotionally for it so you don't lose your cool, so you don't get flustered, that type of thing. You'll also want to be aware of these different types of questions because they have different strengths, and there might be different points in the interviewing process that you might use different ones. You're likely to start with the open-ended question, but when you haven't gotten all the specifics you need, you're likely to follow up with some closed-ended questions. If you're dealing with a witness who maybe isn't completely loyal to, loyal to your side or who has maybe some skeletons in his closet, you may need to insert some leading questions from time to time to really get at the truth. And you may even ask some hypothetical questions. Um, even though this person isn't an expert, um, you might get some ideas about exactly how the situation was. It might be a way to elicit some information that you might not otherwise get. But you ought to think through and be aware of these types of questions, the different types that you're going to ask to see, well, how would we get this information out if this isn't a hostile witness? And so you, you, you perhaps coach the, the witness. Well, you know, you're going to be considered a friendly witness for our side. And so therefore, I'm not going to be able to, the attorney is not going to be able to ask you this question from the witness stand. So you need to, to know what the attorney is getting at when the attorney asks these questions, that this is the type of information that the attorney wants you to uh, present to the, um, to the jury. So um, another thing that's important, of course, is listening skills. This is a kind of a no-brainer thing to talk about, but many times people think about listening skills as being in two categories. One is passive listening skills. This is when you aren't actually talking. You are listening with your ears. After all, you have two ears and one mouth, right? They're all saying about that. Um, so you want to listen carefully. 
and you want the interviewee to understand and appreciate that you're listening carefully. If he thinks that you're not focused on what you're saying, if you're focused on the clock or you're focused on something else going on or you keep on taking a break to check your um, iPhone or something along those lines, he's not going to um, be as forthcoming because you aren't in, as engaged. So you'll want to, via your body language, via the way you uh, present yourself to show a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of interest, a lot of engagement in what he has to say. Then you'll want to use verbal clues such as, oh, that's interesting, or um, what happened next, or things that show that you're listening and that you're seeing the progression of the story. But also nonverbal cues, things like leaning in, nodding your head, um, tilting your head from time to time, being engaged in the flow of the, the presentation. If the interview is drawing a picture or directing your, your eye to a certain photo or a certain document, that you are leaning in and looking at it carefully. Another way to show passive listening is to take careful notes. And you might even say something like, oh, thank you for saying that. Let me be sure to get that down exactly right. In addition to passive listening, it's also important to be an active listener. And this can be a providing um, appropriate feedback. Uh, I already gave an example of this uh, before, which is, oh, really? What happened next? Those types of cues help the interviewee say, hey, this person is gay. They know what I'm saying. They're seeing how the story is building. Another way that is also helpful is to reflect what the interviewee has already said. So the interviewee has told his or her story. And then you might say, now let me just make sure I understand it. Um, it's, uh, let me repeat back to you what you said, and you tell me what I've gotten wrong. Um, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Is that right, or what, what do I have wrong? And, in fact, I encourage you, instead of saying, is that right, because many times the interviewee will say, well, yeah, that's about right, even if it might not be exactly right. But if you were to say to the interviewee, what did I get wrong, then he will point out, maybe you got it 95% correct, he'll point out that 5% that's incorrect. If you say, um, did I get it right, he might be thinking, yeah, you got 95% right, that's good enough, right? And he won't identify that one fact that you got wrong. So it's good to say, what did I do get, get wrong? Or, or what, what part of my story isn't the way that you recall that it happened? Um, another useful technique of active listening is to um, affect the flow of the interview by some techniques. One technique we talked about is letting there be that awkward silence, using that to see how the interviewee responds to that type of social pressure. Um, another approach is to um, try different levels of um, I guess kind of social boundaries. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to start the interview beaten quite friendly and see, well, how does the interviewee respond when um, you seem warm and engaged in the person? Um, that you may find that they're more forthcoming, they're more sharing more information. You might at some point, though, try to be a little bit more distant. See, well, how do they respond when I'm a little bit cooler, a little bit less, oh, thank you, that's awesome, thank you so much for saying that. It might be more like, um, tell me what happened next. Well, what happened after that? See, does their demeanor change or are they the same person? Because you can count on the fact that the other side is likely to search for the, the questioning technique that is going to serve their interest in litigation. So you need to know where the interviewee is going to be most effective. And then you can bring it to the interviewee's attention to the person on your side. Hey, I noticed when I was friendly, you were very forthcoming. When I cooled down and was a little bit more uh, reserved, you got a little bit... Um, uncomfortable with that and you started kind of contradicting some of the things that you said earlier I think because you were uncomfortable well just be aware you know that may be a strategy that the other side uses during the interview then you can prepare your witness for those types of um, uh, uh, responses that they may have you also ought to consider how your interviewee is feeling and what his or her agenda may be everyone always has an agenda they may not even be aware of what the agenda is but they've got it. And they very likely have more than one agenda. Sometimes you can pretty easily anticipate what their agenda is, but sometimes they may have an agenda that there is no way on planet Earth you would have known that they had that particular agenda. So um, 
uh, th there's some guesstimation that goes on here, but uh, those are some things to keep in mind as you uh, prepare for the interview. Um, as you're considering what the interviewee is feeling, that can play a role in how you prepare and how you sequence the questions. You may want to cover the softball stuff at first, the stuff that you know he's going to be willing to share. And then at the end, cover the awkward, the difficult things, the two beers he had at the Chili's. Because if you talk about those first, he might start feeling defensive and the whole rest of the whole tenure, tenor of the rest of the meeting is difficult and he's uncomfortable and he's embarrassed and it just doesn't feel good anymore. When I started practicing law, I'll be honest with you, you're going to think this is silly, um, but I'm probably not the only person this has ever happened to. When I started practicing law, I thought that I was the most lucky legal professional everywhere, anywhere, because my clients always told the truth. It was the other guy who was always lying. Um, and it wasn't until I've been practicing for a few years that suddenly dawned on me, no, wait a second, it's statistically impossible that it's always the other guy who's lying. I mean, surely I've had some clients that have lied to me. Um, in, in most litigation, you're going to find that um, one, uh, the stories can't be completely reconciled, that somebody is not being completely honest. So um, over the years, I've become a much more jaded person, and this is, I'll share with you, hopefully this won't scar you for life, but I'll share with you uh, my experiences with it. And my first experience is that everyone lies all the time. Uh, grandma lies, your employees lie, um, opposing counsel lies, you lie, we all lie. Uh, what we lie about, how important the lie is, when we lie, the reasons for the lie, those might vary, but we're all going to lie and we're all going to lie all the time. Sometimes the reasons that we lie are silly. I sit down with Mary, Bob's wife, and I'm asking some questions, and she tells a lie because um, uh, she's embarrassed that they didn't leave a tip for the uh, the Chili's waitress. And so that's what she's saying, but she's like, oh gosh, the, the paralegal is going to think that we're real jerks because we didn't leave a tip. Um, and that's what she's focused on. It hasn't even occurred to me that's an issue, whether they left a tip or not. Her mind is going there, so she's focused on, well, she doesn't want to talk about that part of it. She doesn't want to talk about getting the bill. When the bill is being presented uh, to her, what she's thinking about is not the two beers on it, but she's thinking about, oh, there's no tip on it. And so you can see that the, the, the thought process is completely different. Sometimes witnesses will lie because they don't want to embarrass themselves or they don't want to embarrass someone else or they may not want to embarrass the person that they're talking to. Um, imagine for a second um, that um, I, uh, let's say I was African American and I'm a paralegal and I'm interviewing somebody and I ask the question, well, what did you, what was your response? Um, what did you say in response? And it so happens that this person used uh, an offensive or racial term. And that would be truthful for him to say, well, you know, I, I said this, this word. Um, but he doesn't want to say that because he doesn't want to embarrass me. He doesn't want to embarrass himself. So he, said, he, he it pretends like he said something else that means the same thing, but doesn't have that um, offensive aspect to it. Um, well, you know what? I need to know that he used that offensive term because it's going to come out. The jury's going to hear that, and some of the people in the jury are going to be most likely African Americans. So it's better that I know about it sooner rather than later so we can decide how it's going to affect our strategy for the litigation and perhaps our settlement strategy. So you need to be aware that there can be lots of dynamics going on and you ought not be lulled, in, uh, lulled into that sense of a feeling like, oh, well, everything my client told me is truthful. Some people believe that they can detect when somebody is lying. Uh, study after study indicates, though, that the vast, vast majority of us are um, very, very poor at detecting lies. So um, the fact that you think this person is being truthful, you shouldn't put a lot of emphasis upon it. They might be, or they might not. But your ability to predict that, unless you're one of those rare, rare people that seem to have a, a built-in radar, um, probably you don't have it and probably you're not likely to be 
that accurate. People many times can lie very persuasively. So let's talk about interviewing clients, which of course is an important part of the interviewing process. We already talked about the initial client interview, how it's usually conducted by the attorney, because after all, we're looking at establishing the attorney-client relationship. Um, the paralegal often will be present to also be introduced to the client, and he or she may be helping with forms, with taking notes, things like that. This is a really awesome time in the process for the attorney to explain to the client what his or her role is and also to explain the role of the paralegal so that the client doesn't get confused. Most, not, most clients are not going to be legal professionals. They don't know what a paralegal is. They don't know what a paralegal does versus what an attorney does. So um, those are just terms that are being thrown around for them. It needs to be explained in a very actionable way. And part of this is going to be, well, the legal distinction between a paralegal and a trade, but part of it is going to relate to the particular dynamics in this law practice. What do paralegals do in this practice versus what attorneys do? So it will need to be customized for the law firm that, yeah, it, where this client is, is, is uh, uh, relating to. Um, but this is a good time to say, you know, the paralegal doesn't answer a strategic question doesn't give legal advice. I, the attorney, will be the one responsible for that. But the paralegal will be gathering information and that type of thing, and you ought to feel comfortable being forthcoming with the paralegal. As I said, sometimes paralegals are involved in intake situations. This is especially common in um, plaintiff's practices. And that goes back to the dynamics of a plaintiff's law firm. Let's talk about that for a second. I'm going to clear the slide. Um, imagine that you are working for a plaintiff's law firm. Well, the vast, vast majority of plaintiffs don't have a lot of disposable income. After all, that's oftentimes one of the reasons why they want to sue someone. Maybe they've been in a car accident. Um, they've lost their car. Maybe they have have some significant medical bills. Maybe they've had to be off work because of their injuries that they've experienced. Well, somebody in that situation isn't likely to have, you know, twenty or $30,000 to give to an attorney. Um, to represent them in the case. So most plaintiff's law firms are going to use a contingency fee arrangement. And the way a contingency fee works is that the attorney or the law firm, let's put it that way, will get a percentage of any recovery that the plaintiff gets. Usually it's somewhere between 25 and 40 percent. For the ease of calculation, I'm going to use 30 percent, but that's by no means some magic, magical number. It can be that much or it can be more or less. So let's look at that. Let's say that the plaintiff gets a million dollars. Okay? So 30% of that million dollars is 300000 That's what the law firm gets. And of course, the client would get the other 700000 It doesn't actually work out to be 700000 There's taxes and expenses that have to be taken out of this. But this is the gross amount. Um, but let's imagine um, instead that the um, plaintiff got $10,000, either through a judgment or through a settlement. Well, then the law firm would get $3,000, and the plaintiff would get a gross amount of $7,000 for a total of $10,000. But... Um, the number that the law firm gets, the $3,000, is not contingent upon the number of hours that the law firm works. It could be that the plaintiff hires the law firm, the attorney calls opposing counsel and says, hey, you want to sell this for $10,000? Opposing counsel goes, sure, let's do it. And the plaintiff's attorney may spend you know, an hour or two on the case, and he gets $3,000. Well, very nice payday for him, right? On the other hand, uh, the plaintiff's attorney may have spent 300 hours on this case and just gets $3,000. That's $10 an hour, a very low amount of money, especially given the fact that the law firm has a significant amount of overhead. So really, lost quite a bit of money on that case, most likely. So the amount in the contingency fee arrangement, the amount of time that the law firm spent on the case does not affect the recovery. Let's think about another situation. Let's say that the plaintiff goes to trial and the jury finds in favor of the defendant and awards the plaintiff zero money. Well, as you probably guessed, 30% uh, of zero is still zero. The plaintiff's law firm may have spent thousands of hours on this case, and they're getting zero dollars per hour on that case. 
Well, you can see, given these economic realities, that if you are a plaintiff's law firm, you are very much going to want to screen the plaintiff. You are going to have three categories of questions that you're going to care significantly about. First of all, you're going to want to see, does the plaintiff have a good case? Are the facts good? If um, uh, the the uh, uh, police officer who arrived at the scene gave your client a ticket and didn't give the other guy a ticket, well, probably the plaintiff isn't going to win the case. At least the, the, that um, uh, police officer didn't feel like the plaintiff has a good case. So you want to look at the facts of the case. And you won't want to just trust what the plaintiff says. Obviously, the plaintiff is uh, likely thinking he's got a good case. And even if he doesn't think that, he may be willing to stretch the truth a little bit. So you're going to want to look for objective facts. You're going to want to look at what the police officer did or what other records might exist that would support what the plaintiff is saying. So you'll want to look to see how strong the plaintiff's case is. Number one. But that's not enough. That is only one of the three elements that you care about. The second element you care about is what are the damages like? It may be obvious that your potential client, the plaintiff, has a rock-solid case, definitely going to win, but the damages are trivial. It was just uh, a fender bender, and the most that the plaintiff can expect to recover is $5,000, and even that's probably more than the plaintiff is going to be able to win. Well, $5,000 at 30% is not a lot of money. That is $1,500. If you are an attorney and you bill, we'll say, at $300, which is on the low side, that's five hours of your effort. After you've met with the client for an hour, done some independent research, you're almost up at the whole value of the case for, for your law firm. So you can see under the circumstances, even though the client's a rock-solid case, if there aren't significant damages, probably doesn't make sense um, to represent the, the client. But that, even if you have a client that has a rock-solid case, or you have a potential client that has a rock-solid case and awesome, very high damages, there's still there's only two of the three elements that the plaintiff's law firm cares about. The third is you need a deep pocket. Here, I'm going to just move the pocket here. Um, you need a defendant or an insurance company for the defendant that are going to pay the judgment. Imagine for a second that... Your client was in a car accident. It was obviously the other guy's fault. Your client was very severely injured, very high damages. But the person who was responsible for the accident, the potential defendant, had no auto insurance, doesn't have a job, doesn't have any real assets. Yes, you'll be able, if you accept this case, you will be able to persuade a jury to award a million dollars or more in damages against the defendant. But you can't get blood out of a turnip. If the defendant doesn't have any money, guess what? A million dollar judgment is worth squat. So you need to have all three elements. Good facts, good damages, and a deep pocket. It doesn't have to be the defendant's money. It could be, again, the insurance company or some other uh, deep pocket that, that can be responsible for it. So that's what happens in, on the plaintiff side in that intake situation. And being an intake paralegal in a plaintiff's law firm is a pretty common starting job for a paralegal. You'll be given a checklist of questions, um, and you'll meet with the potential client, and you'll ask questions relating to the, the same topics that I talked about. And then you'll gather that information. You'll review it. You'll, the, the, you'll have, have asked that the potential client bring in, say, the um, doctor's bills, the police report, um, other information that's going to support on those three pillars that we talked about earlier. And then you'll analyze it, and based upon the guidelines the law firm has given you, you may well make a recommendation to the attorney or attorney saying, I think that this case has good facts for the potential client, high damages, and a deep pocket. I think we should take this. Or you might say, no, it's missing one of those. I don't think we should take it. In a plaintiff's practice, um, plaintiff's law firms routinely turn away plaintiffs who want to be represented on a contingency fee basis. So um, that intake function is very, very important. We've already talked about subsequent interviews. A common reason that you have those subsequent interviews is to gather information or documents, other pieces of data. And again, you ought to reinforce the role that you have in the practice. So that the, because uh, again, the, the client during the first meeting or two with the attorney may be very um, overwhelmed 
a meeting with an attorney. This is a big deal. Maybe I'm getting a divorce. Maybe there's something major happening in my life. I'm not processing everything that I hear the first time. And so this can be a good a time to reiterate it. We're a little bit of passage of time. You've had a little bit of time to think about it. Let me repeat what you might have heard before. Maybe it'll sink in the second time. Sometimes those interviews aren't about gathering information. They can be about relaying information to the client. So there's lots of different things that can be going on here. Um, and that example of that would be an informational interview. You might want to discuss upcoming legal proceedings with the client. For example, you're going to be deposed. Let me tell you what that deposition is going to be like. Um, and so that's different. As opposed to you gathering information from the client, you're actually giving information to the client. After you're done with a, that client interview, you're going to want to summarize the interview. You may well be taking notes during the interview, but you'll want to formalize it at the conclusion um, after the client has left so that you can um, add some additional information. Obviously, you're somewhat limited in what you can write when the client might actually look over your shoulder and say, what are you writing? Um, that's especially important for client relations that you don't uh, make notations that might offend the client. For example, say something like, I think the client is lying about that. Um, when the client can read what you're saying, not so impressive. Uh, that would definitely be something you'd want to make a notation about um, after the client has left, if you even want to put that in the file at all on a formal basis. Um, it's best to summarize the interview as soon after the interview is over as possible when your memory is the most uh, robust, where you have the greatest memory of what happened. And it's a good idea in that summary to include nonverbal impressions. You might even draw pictures that will put a better understanding about uh, you know, where people were in relation to one another or what happened. Um, if there were long pauses, you'd ask your, your client a question, and it seemed like the type of question that he ought to have a quick answer to, and there was a long pause, and he seemed to stumble over his words, and he seemed to say contradictory things. Those would be indications that you might want to make a notation about uh, that might make you wonder, is my client being honest? Does my client have memory issues? Is my client excessively nervous? Is he intoxicated? Those types of issues. And you'd want to make notations about that. I'm going to conclude this uh, presentation at this point. We'll have another uh, presentation on um, this uh, Chapter 10. Um, that will be available to you soon. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.